I mean, if we ever have time to do like individual religions and not like a survey of all of them, I would love to go into a lot more detail and talk about the different sects of Hinduism and how they're practiced, but I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand the core principle. So to be fair, if you went to India, you might not be experiencing like what I'm teaching you in this class. You'd probably be seeing a lot more like folk Hinduism, kind of like folk Catholicism. Catholicism is going to be very different if you talk to like a Jesuit priest or someone who's well educated and learned as opposed to someone maybe in Guatemala who has like this syncretism with Native American religions and Catholicism and you have this weird mix going on and you have the same thing that happens in Hinduism. But good question. Everyone understand this diamond analogy? Another thing I want you to, to realize that a lot of people in the West, especially Christians, don't get is Hinduism also has a trinity. Yes. <laughs> in fact, the more we talk about Hinduism, you might be thinking, wait a second, I believe this is all the same stuff I believe. What's going on? The high god in Hinduism is called Brahman. But he's so high, he's beyond description. There's no like qualities to talk about him. He's beyond this or that, beyond creator or destroyer, beyond love and hate. It's just this high God. So you don't actually find a lot of devotees to Brahman because there's nothing tangible or human to latch onto. Where you find most of the devotees is devotees of Vishnu, or devotees of Shiva. But these three make up the Hindu trinity, but the three are one. Remember, there's only one God with different manifestations. Vishnu, and this is a super loose analogy, so don't take it too far, but I know most of you are from a Christian background. Vishnu is kind of like the Holy Spirit in some ways, in that he's the preserver He's there to help and aid mankind, bring them gifts. If darkness comes, he brings light into an area. In fact, Hinduism, out of the Trinity, and specifically out of the Godhead of Vishnu, we have an incarnation. And this incarnation is Krishna. So if you went to India as a Christian missionary, and you were saying, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, who became man and dwelt among us, they would probably tell you, oh yes, we know this one. We call him Krishna. And Krishna is a physical manifestation, or an avatar. And the avatar is a manifestation in this physical world of the, God, of the gods. But for Hinduism, and this is very different from the West, for Hindus, the spiritual world is reality. The physical world is maya or illusion. And you might be saying, what are you talking about the physical world's illusion? I don't mean illusion in the sense it's not real. It has realness, as all illusions do. But it's transitory. Everything you see around you, every physical thing, including your bodies, the chairs, the tables, the desk, your professor, all of this will one day pass away. It's not permanent. It's impermanent. What's permanent, what lasts, and what abides is the spiritual realm. That's what's eternal. Sound familiar? <laughs> So Shiva, this part of the Godhead is like, reminds me a lot of like Yahweh of the Old Testament, of the Jews. Shiva is the Lord of the dance, the creator, the destroyer. He brings, he blesses those who are his devotees and he wants to bless, and he brings judgment and destruction on the ignorant, the evil, those going against the rule of the 
You also didn't see Shiva like the multi-armed god with doing like the cosmic dance, and his foot is standing on the dwarf of ignorance, crushing it into the ground. Each of these has a consort or a female counterpart. If you saw Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, you saw Kalima, the consort of Shiva. She has like a necklace of human skulls and, and all that sort of thing. And so, and each of them produce offspring, and this is how we get like Ganesh and all these other different ones. And, and we'll talk more about that probably next class. We'll get into more detail. So what's the point of Hinduism or the goal? Well, the point is to get past this veil of illusion and get back to Godhead. And Hinduism also has the belief in these different incarnations. Often this is an eight-spoke wheel, but I'm just going to do a 6.1 for simplicity. Okay, so we got this cosmic wheel. principle of reincarnation. And let's call this out here like the Sea of Brahman or the Sea of the Godhead. And out of Godhead, you get beings projected or incarnated into, this is like the space-time continuum, the world of illusion, the world that's always changing but is not, has no permanence, like the spiritual realm of the Godhead. And so you might get cast into this, and you have God manifest himself as maybe some single cell organism, like a paramecium. And each being that comes into the world has a specific dharma. And dharma has been translated like deeds of righteousness, or let's just make it simpler and strip it of its religious connotation. It's kind of like your purpose. Everyone's placed here for a purpose. There's a reason you're manifest in this world at this time, and that's your dharma. And you need to fulfill that. If you don't fulfill your dharma, you have to come back again and again until you accomplish what you were placed here to do. You're not just accidents. It's not just a meaningless reason. You're here for a specific point and purpose. For the paramecium, it might be quite simple. It might simply be to divide and replicate. And once it does that, it gets to reincarnate. And reincarnation, basically, it's God's spirit. Brahma himself is taking on different vehicles. He can take on the vehicle of a paramecium, of an ant, of a butterfly, of a human. And it's just like a car. You get a new car, you drive it, it wears out, breaks down. It doesn't mean you die. You get out of the car and get a new vehicle. And that's how reincarnation works. You just keep changing vehicles. Like, you're not in the same vehicle you were born in. None of you were born in these bodies. You have kept trading vehicles. I'm on my seventh, ooh, eighth vehicle. Woo! And for some reason, the models keep getting a little rougher each year. But I'm on my eighth vehicle. Every seven years, basically, you get a new vehicle as a human being. Your cells are completely replaced, and you're getting a new start. Not all at once, of course, that would be kind of shocking, but gradually your body replaces. Wait, so the god Shiva, or how do you say it, is the one that's... Creator, destroyer. Well, so... Very popular. So are all of these three gods the gods that are becoming kind of thing? No. There's only one god that's right. manifesting but himself. Like, so the... Well, Certain... That, the ones that are like personifications of the Godhead, like God manifesting himself in flesh, those are called avatars. But every single thing in the world, this coffee mug, those pair of glasses, my chair, you, me, the tree outside, the bird that just flew over the village, those are all manifestations of the divine. Okay. But 
personifications, kind of, of the divine are avatars. But the end goal, where we're headed in Hinduism, is that's what true enlightenment is, is when you realize who you actually are. That you're God? Yes. Okay. That, that, that's where we're going. Okay. I just, I'm working my way there. I've got a few more rungs on the wheel to go. So I'll, I'll abbreviate. So maybe your next life you come back as an ant, and your little ant, oh, so you've got three colors, sorry, three quarters. So you come back as a little ant, and maybe you come back, you're a worker ant, worker ant, worker ant, you know, you die, you keep coming back, reborn as a worker ant, worker ant. You get elevated up to be a soldier ant, soldier ant, soldier ant. Maybe you really blow it as a soldier ant, and so you have to go back a few rungs and start as a worker ant again, and you keep working your way back, and then eventually after maybe a thousand lifetimes or a hundred lifetimes of being in different ants, you get to be a drone, drone, queen, queen, queen. You finally fulfill your ant dharma because the other principle is karma. And karma is kind of like this idea of you reap what you sow. I mean, I'm trying to put it in Christianese for you because I know that's your background, but you reap what you sow. This is like acts of righteousness, your charisma in Catholic terms, like what you were put here on the earth to do. This is, you know, you're kind to others, kindness will come back to you. You're mean, hateful, murderous, a liar, murder, lies, hate will come back to you. And so whatever bad karma you do in this lifetime, if you don't make it right in this lifetime, you have to come back and make it up in your next lifetime. So basically, everyone is incarnated or reincarnated exactly where you deserve to be. If you're a woman, it's because something about your past life made you come back as a woman this life. Maybe you were like a misogynist in your last life. You were very mean and hateful to women and judgmental, sexist, chauvinist. So you came back as a woman this time to help you pay off that bad dharma. And maybe you're going to have a lifetime of people being sexist to you and chauvinistic and brutal to you. Um, maybe you were born with a disease. Well, maybe it's because of what you did in your last life. And now you're having to pay the karmic debt for that past life. Yes, Jeff? Do we ever remember like our like what we did? or? Yeah. So basically, we where we stand today. Not everyone will remember, and some people are, it's their first time around as humans. But some of us have been back many times. I never really believed in this until it was in my college years, I was about your age, and I was studying like medieval architecture and monasteries. I don't know why, I was just drawn to like these monks and medieval architectures. And I started drawing these like interconnected eight-pointed stars until I was one day looking through this book, and so I was drawing these interconnected eight-pointed stars, and I had them, whoops, I had them all in my um, notebooks, and one day I was looking through this medieval architecture, and someone had laid on their back and taken a picture up into this bell tower, and it was my star, and all of a sudden I realized I had been a part of that monastery, like 400 years earlier. And everything made so much sense. And I could see why I felt so displaced. It's because I had like unfinished business from that past life and karmic debt I had to secure. Like I think I was supposed to be a teacher at like a church school in that time and instead I fled to the desert as a hermit. And even though I still struggle with that today, I'm here now fulfilling my dharma and trying to get rid of the bad dharma so I can get on with the progression. So after you do the ant stuff, or whatever, then maybe you get to be a butterfly. You do your butterfly dharma, get, hopefully don't accumulate butterfly karma, and then maybe you get to be like a cute little rabbit, or a mouse, and you do your little rabbit dharma, and have make rabbit babies, and whatever that is, and then maybe you get to come back as like a, a fox, or, or a coyote, and you take care of your little fox or coyote dharma, 